welcome to another episode of the Tom Schirmer Podcast. Happy Monday, everyone. I hope everyone had a great weekend. Uh, we celebrated another birthday this weekend. My son turned 21. Uh, we were hoping, of course, to head to Las Vegas in and around his 21st birthday, as you do when you turn 21. Uh, but we've, of course, had to put those plans on hold. Uh, we know it'll happen one day, but for now, we wait until travel across the Canadian U.S. border becomes less arduous, and we definitely see uh, a shift in where we are with with COVID. Uh, thanks for listening in again this week, and as I always say, a big welcome to any new listeners joining in for the first time. Your listening and or subscribing to the podcast is much appreciated. And again, please don't be shy about spreading the word on social media with your colleagues, etc. And also, if you feel up to it, leaving a rating or review uh, on Apple Podcasts as well. That would also be appreciated. You are going to love today's guest. Uh, Dr. Muhammad Khalifa joins me this week to talk about culturally responsive school leadership, which is also the title of his highly acclaimed book. I swear every one of his responses is a memorable soundbite, so I think you're really going to enjoy that. In assessment corner this week, I'm going to begin an examination of homework. I'll begin today with some of the research around homework and some of the perspectives that are out there, and the intent would be to continue this topic next week. So that's today's plan. Let's get to it. My interview with Dr. Muhammad Khalifa is coming up shortly, but first, don't at me. But I want to open this week with a bit of frustration that has been building in me for a while. Now, it's not a 10 out of 10 on the frustration scale, but it is something I'm finding both frustrating and exhausting. And that is debating both sides of an issue. I, I just find this completely exhausting. Now, I realize that this is a first world problem, but Nonetheless, it's frustrating, and I'm going to tell you about it. For a number of months now, I'm, I'm finding myself coming up the middle on so many issues and topics, and what's mentally exhausting is trying to debate people on both sides of that issue. Now, look, I'm okay. Don't, don't worry about it, uh, but I need to vent, and what better place to vent than on the podcast, right? There seems to be this trend in society right now, and I think I've hinted at this many times in the past this whole trend of balance being indecisiveness. That when you find balance on an issue or see both sides of an issue, you're just being indecisive. But I simply reject that entire assertion. The absolutes in life and in society in general are just few and far between. So let's start with the biggest issue going right now, and that is COVID and the vaccine. And some listeners, of course, will remember way back in episode one when I talked about finding your balance with COVID uh, as sort of school returned in the fall. Now, I come up the middle on vaccines. So, of course, I get it on both sides. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. On the one hand, I'm not afraid of COVID. And I really don't want the vaccine. According to the World Health Organization, the global death rate for COVID is around 2%. Now, it's around the same for Canada, and it's actually less than that for the United States. Now, that alone is an interesting fact because go back a year, I remember a lot of Canadian arrogance when COVID was running rampant in the United States. The smugness from some of my fellow Canadians was nauseating, to say the least. My, how the tables have turned. Now, 2%. That doesn't even account for health, age, pre-existing conditions. So I think I could be safe in assuming that it's potentially much less for me because while I'm no picture of perfect health, I am pretty healthy and I still have a strong immune system. Now, I'm 53, not 33, but still, I rarely get sick. And when I do, I actually recover quite quickly. I've never had a flu shot, for example never needed one, and have recovered just fine from the flu. I don't actually catch the flu very often, but when I did, I would recover in a matter of days. Now, don't give me the whole, well, Tom, you never know what could happen. Of course you never know. I mean, I can't predict the future. No one can. But if we're going to start living out of fear of the unknown, if we're just going to live out of, well, you never know, as a hypothetical, then, you know, I don't know where that ends. 
there is always a risk in life. Driving is risky. Uh, you know, smoking. I mean, how come smoking is still legal? Uh, if, if, we're, if we're talking about you never know, can anyone name any long-term positive at all that comes from smoking? People are allowed to choose smoking. Why are they allowed to choose that? If you never know is the threshold, well, smoking has blown way past that. We know that there are so many negative, and yet people have the choice. It's still legal. It's still allowed. It's still all of those things, right? There it is. I believe in the body's natural immune system, and right now, I have zero other medical conditions. If I did, I might think differently. So I personally prefer not to have the vaccine. And, and listen, you can spare me the lectures, okay? Uh, the, the COVID shaming and self-righteousness I've seen over the last year, again, nauseating as far as I'm concerned. But I am not an anti-vaxxer. Not even close. While I'm not afraid of COVID, I'm not afraid of the vaccine either. And I've had many vaccines over my lifespan. For example, just in the last few years, when I went to Nigeria, I had to have a yellow fever vaccination. And I got it. Well, because first, they wouldn't let me in the country without it. And two, I don't really want to catch yellow fever. Okay, according to the CDC, yellow fever has a 20 to 50% death rate. So yeah, sign me up. Do I want the COVID vaccine? Not really. Will I get it? Yeah, I will. Vaccines are a wonder of modern medicine. You know, I, I see my smallpox vaccine scar every day on my shoulder. Uh, I've had numerous vaccines over my lifespan and have had zero effects. You see, I see both sides of that issue. But it's exhausting when you're talking to people. When I speak to the uh, fire away with the vaccine crowd, I feel like I get sort of cast as an anti-vaxxer because I'm like, well, wouldn't it be better for some of us to develop natural immunity? Yes, vaccinations for the elderly or vaccinations for the vulnerable. But do we all have to get it? Uh, is it, you know... There, there are some serious ramifications to COVID. We know that. But there are also others who have tested positive. And I know a few of these people personally. They have tested positive and have had no symptoms. So it's not really that predictable. But then on the other side, when I speak to the anti-vax crowd, if you will, people who are sort of against vaccines as a blanket kind of position, I feel like I get cast as uh, gullible or naive or... Um, you know, because my response is, well, you know, there's a reason we eradicated measles by the early 2000s and only had it return completely unnecessarily a decade later as a direct result of people refusing to vaccinate their children. So those against the vaccine will always cite the rare, serious side effects that people have had with the vaccine, but they'll never tell you which one, which vaccine. They just say the vaccine. So it's interesting how they never really name them. And the AstraZeneca vaccine is the only one that has really come out with some specifics. And again, the percentages of that, according to the Center for Infectious, Infectious Disease Research and Policy at the University of Minnesota, as of April 4th, the European Union surveillance has received 169 reports of cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, or CVST and 53 reports of splanchic vein thrombosis. I hope I'm saying that right. Among the 34 million vaccines. So CBST, that is 0.0005%. And SVT, it's 0.00016%. That is astronomically lower than the risks with COVID. Definitely much lower than the rate of dying from complications of COVID and even sort of the long-lasting conditions. And on the at the same time, it's still 169 people, right? And 53 people, respectively. It's, it, it's still human beings that have had negative results. That's not good for those 222 people. But when you consider that every medication or every you know treatment has potential side effects. Have you ever read the number of side effects to any medication that you've ever taken? Me neither. And yet we know that that's there. For some reason, we'll pop pills all day long, but as soon as any treatment or medication or anything like that 
comes proactively, comes in the form of a needle and a liquid, suddenly the fear-mongering begins. And while I don't think you should accept things blindly, we can't just minimize the impact of COVID while magnifying the impact of vaccines. That's just an argument of convenience where you're just trying to defend your initial perspective. Do I want the vaccine? No. Will I get it? Yeah. But the whole thing is just exhausting. Now, the same has emerged for me in the area of assessment and grading. Lately, and I mean, what I mean by lately is over the last few months, I've been finding myself constantly defending and debating on both sides of the assessment issues. As you've heard me say, listeners, a thousand times, nuance and balance doesn't sell. So I find myself being put in positions to defend things that I don't really want to defend, but it comes across that way because of the extreme positions people take. When you defend the middle, you end up sounding like you're defending something that you don't really want to defend necessarily. Now, from where I sit, the volume or definitiveness with which you assert something doesn't correlate to how correct it is. Okay, scream and rant all you want to in person or on social media. That doesn't make your false assertion any truer. So I find myself getting caught in these conversations, especially about grades. When people make these exaggerated assertions about grades, right? The whole uh, grades are of the devil crowd. I find myself saying, you know, now hold on a minute here, okay? People asserting things like grades are arbitrary and they're, and they're meaningless. What? If grades are arbitrary and meaningless, then you're the one that made them that way. Grades will be as meaningful or as meaningless as the adults make them. You know, there was this one assertion made about grades spreading perpetual lies about students or something like that. I mean, what a ridiculous thing to say. If your district requires grades, but you didn't determine those grades with clear criteria and gradations of quality, then whose fault is that? Even when it's a percentage-based scale, you can still use criteria. You know, anyway, so I, I feel like I'm defending grades in those situations, and I really don't want to do that. You know, you end up sounding like a grade everything guy, and I'm not. Kids don't need grades to learn, and teachers don't need grades to teach, but these extreme assertions about grades need to be checked. So on the other side, you have people who assert, well, if I don't grade it, they won't do it, that crowd. And then you have to counter with discussions about feedback and formative assessment and not scoring everything. And then again, you sound like you're anti-grade when you're not really, okay? I've talked about that several times on the podcast already. My favorite story about being anti-grade, uh, and, and maybe I mentioned this story before, I, I don't remember, but was this person who was attending, this gentleman was attending my Grading from the Inside Out two-day workshop. And midway through the first day of the workshop, he says to me, Tom, I don't understand. And he, he raised his hand. So this is public. He says this publicly. Tom, I don't understand why you're so anti-grade. And I was thinking to myself, what? So I looked at him and I said, the word grading is literally the first word in the title of the book you're holding. And that was my book, Grading from the Inside Out. And he kind of paused for a moment. And it was a fun moment, to be clear. It was, we, we, we all kind of laughed, including the gentleman who had asked me the original question. But you could see where that was going. He had assumed things about the things I was talking about in the first half of the training that just weren't true and just weren't on point, but he had sort of created that in his own mind. This binary approach to conversation seems to have permeated every single part of our society now, and it seems that once you've staked out a position, that's it. Like, I honestly am so tired of this whole pick-a-side mentality, the kind of all-or-nothing, you know, go all-in, double down, never waver. You know, the idea that, that your level of conviction equals how right you are, um, that's, we, we've lost our way with that entire mindset. We should always be open to waver. We should always be open to having our minds changed. We should always find balance because when you come up the middle, you can do two things at once, right? I, I, I'm finding I need to do much less wavering and much less changing my mind because when you start from a position of balance, you can literally see both sides of an issue. Now, I think, at least partly, 
the reason some are so definitive is because we've got into a habit, collectively, of associating our identity with our beliefs. And, and, and that kind of feels different than it used to, right? So, for example, in politics, right? So what party you support or belong to and believe in starts to become an identity. You know, the way that in the United States, the way that the word Democrat or Republican is used, it's, a, it's an identity, both positive and negative, depending upon who's using the term. In education, you know, we have these unwavering stances, you know, that, that almost becomes our brand, our identity, which then, of course, backs you into a corner. If you're, if you're carving out an identity based on a position, it's hard to compromise that position and say, you know, I've changed my mind. So when you come out hot on an issue and then suddenly, you know, issues might change, you're kind of stuck. Like you either backtrack, which I guess looks, you know, to, to, to the person, it might look indecisive or they might feel they're compromising their positions or you kind of stay stuck, right? There's any number of issues that you can think of where, where this is all concerned. Like, I don't really know what the answer is. Uh, I don't. Now, I know this can come off as trying to be the voice of reason or above it or bringing the mature perspective. And, and I suppose in some ways it is. I would say that one of my most important life lessons has been to not over or underreact to most situations and to really see both sides of a topic. I'm not saying I've mastered that uh, by any stretch, but it is something I'm always aware of. Is there a solution? I don't know. Until people can start disassociating their identity from their beliefs, at least a little bit, I, I don't know if it's going to change. If what you believe is not just what you think, but who you are, I think that's the problem. I, I don't think it has anything to do with how convicted or even right you are. It's, it's the, the connection of my identity to, to my beliefs. Now, in some ways, it's hard to separate those two, but I think we have to try to find a way to at least put a little, a little wedge between the two. You know, there is this burning desire to be known for something. Um, and that, in fact, gets rewarded today. But I think there's a fine line that can easily cross over into blind spots and stubbornness. And that, to me, becomes unhealthy for real conversations. It needs to change. I'm not exactly sure how. So until then, I guess I'll just keep debating on both sides of the issues and trying to find ways to recoup from the mental exhaustion. <laughs> Thanks for listening. I feel a lot better now because I had to get that off my chest. Joining me today for the interview is Dr. Mohammed Khalifa. Uh, Dr. Khalifa is Professor of Educational Administration and Executive Director of Urban Education Initiatives at The Ohio State University. His research examines how urban school leaders enact culturally responsive leadership and anti-oppressive school practices. He is the author of the highly acclaimed book, Culturally Responsive School Leadership, and that is exactly why Dr. Khalifa is here today. Um, I was introduced to Dr. Khalifa's work through my colleague, Nicole, and uh, really, really looking forward to the opportunity to, to speak with Dr. Khalifa today. So Dr. Khalifa, welcome to the Tom Schubert Podcast. Thank you so much. It's a delight, a pleasure to be here. I appreciate the space. Yeah, really, really happy to have you here. Uh, and I've been looking forward to this conversation for a long time. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Nicole, uh, my friend and colleague, introduced me to your work when we were at the AERA conference in Toronto. Uh, in 2019. And uh, she said, you know, you have to read this book. And I bought the book and I immersed myself in it immediately. And honestly, I, I can't recommend it enough. So listeners, uh, Culturally Responsive Leadership by Dr. Muhammad Khalifa uh, is the book. So I'm excited to, uh, to dig into the content of that book today. But I want to begin, uh, before we dig into that, I want to begin with the Derek Chauvin trial uh, in, in Minneapolis. As I know, uh, you now are at Ohio State University, but of course, you, you spent years at the University of Minnesota and spent a, lo a lot of time in the Minneapolis-St. Paul uh, area in the Twin Cities. So I'm wondering, from your perspective, um, as you think about the trial that's still ongoing, um, do you have a sense of, first, how are you, how are you feeling in terms of the, you know, the, the trial itself? And, and do you have a sense of the collective kind of atmosphere or mood in the Twin Cities right now as the trial unfolds? Yeah. So, so first of all, we're fresh to Ohio. We, we've been here for about six months. So we were there. Yeah. Um, 
when George Floyd happened. Uh, it's funny, I remember where I was at each moment that these sort of high, highly publicized uh, police killings of black men. I remember the exact place that I was. So we lived in an area where Philando Castile was less than a mile from my home. We lived right there. Um, and we would drive by <clears throat> the uh, makeshift uh, space in which it was killed where people put flowers out. And every time we go by there, it's a re-traumatization of what happened, it's a reminder. So when people talk about black folks in these health conditions and that they're disproportionately high in cancer and diabetes and heart disease, I can understand why, because, uh, you know, I remember exactly where I was when Rodney King happened. And I remember exactly where I was. And I remember the principal coming to, I was sort of like a, a leader in, in my high school. Um, and the principal came to me and said, you know, uh, the officers were acquitted, but we think that it could, because riots were happening around the country at that time. And we think some things should happen at the high school. Since you're kind of a leader, can you make sure that black people are not angry and don't um, riot or do anything um, destructive? And I said, I, I'm, I'm a part of that group that's angry. I mean, like, wh 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 why are you asking us to quell our anger? I mean, so we thought at that moment that this is absolute, all the proof you need. You see uh, four, five, six officers just trying to kill a black man on the pavement. We knew that this has been happening for a while. It's been happening to all of us, but now we have it on film. There's no way that these officers, the guy was defenseless, he was on the ground. There's no way. He posed no threat and they were acquitted. So I've barely been following the trial. Um, I, I hear sound bites and I hear that this person sobbed on the stand or I hear that, the, but I, I, I cannot allow myself to constantly be exposed to, of course, I'm waiting for the verdict. Uh, I don't have, I, I would not at all be shocked, at all be shocked if he was acquitted, not at all. And be, so, so in order to protect my own humanity, in order to protect my own sensibilities, my feelings and everything like that, I, I, I'm predicting that uh, he will be acquitted most likely. And I'm also predicting that uh, it won't come as a shock or a surprise because, you know, we have to protect ourselves from being hurt with this. Um, and I, I don't know if other black men are experiencing the same kind of trauma and same disposition that I have. I can't, you know, I can't say it's, it's, it's why, but um, I'm not going to follow the trial day by day and, and see the lies that the state, the state always tries to protect itself. Everybody knows that. And um, right. see the lies that they put out and, you know, ruin the, uh, try, try to demonize and try to completely criminalize the brother's character, all of that. Uh, I come from, a, 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 a lot of people don't know this about me, I come from a, a spiritual faith tradition. And one of the tenets that we hold dear is to constantly give um, to people who are in need, right? Uh, and there's some special groups like the poor, the needy, the orphan, elderly people. And sometimes, so some of those groups, they, ha they have, um, they have, some some issues like I have I have issues with addiction in my family. I have issues with uh, criminality in my family. Uh, I have recidivism as an issue that pops up in my family. And what what we do in my faith tradition is that we never ever ever look at a person's errors, their shortcomings, in order to determine whether or not we give. If they need it, we give. If they need food, we get them food. That's it. You don't stand in judgment of people when you're trying to help them. And that's exactly what this trial is trying to do. You know, this person was murdered. He was assassinated. And instead of focusing on that, now it's about his habits, his character. And so I, I can't deal with that kind of traumatization. Yeah. So I'm trying to stay a little bit distant from the trial. Yeah, and that's fair. And I, you know, uh, what you've just expressed is a common uh, thread and theme that I've heard from, from you know, um, pundits and, and other Black men on TV just saying almost identical things to what you're saying, which is we've been here before. And we would have thought that video evidence would have been the game changer. I, I know for myself back, you know, with Rodney King, I thought, well, okay, this, this is irrefutable. This, this is, it's on video. And even, you know, that, that 30 years now of, of it being on video really hasn't made a difference. So I understand uh, completely, I, at least I can, I, I can't understand, but I'm empathetic to, to the level of cynicism about the system and, and whether or not the system really truly is here to protect all citizens. Or now we've got a situation, as you mentioned, 
George Floyd seems to be on trial right now half the time. It yeah. seems to be a question of his character and all of that. So, um, but I, but I, but there's a Tom. There's a value. I know you have another question to get to, but yeah, there's a yeah. valuable lesson for educators here, which yeah. is that culture will eat policy and process for lunch every day of the week. Mm -hmm. uh, and and that's something that educators don't quite get. I write about this extensively in my research okay. from the from yeah. the vantage point of being a technical rational leader, which is that when you're uncomfortable with the context when race comes up, when racism or any of these things come up, uh, you know, you automatically as a school leader run to the policy book instead of looking at the broader context. Right. And this just suggests how powerful the notion of uh, discourse, descriptions of people, how people are categorized, how strong, even though these some of these ideas were birthed four or 500 years ago, even before I, I, I talk about this in the, in the Institute a lot, but even before America as a country, as a Republic was established, some of the ideas about black people, some of the ideas about people from the global South were established at that time in the minds of European uh, America, uh, Europeans, and then European Americans, white people about the other. And you could have as many, it, it rings true. You could have as many witnesses, you could have video evidence, you could have the police, you could have the entire system lining up to have a person convicted, but the ideas that black life is not worth much and that white uh, safety needs to be protected, white uh, security needs to be protected at the expense of all else, including black life, including indigenous life, those ideas are still very powerful and at the very epistemological surface of uh, educators, of police, of the society at large. So I, I can, I'll, I'll stop there because I know yeah. we got to get. To the that's, a, that's okay. <laughs> no, you, you, uh, you know, I mean, you, you take it, take things where you, where you need to go. I think your the point is well taken. And um, I, I just, you know, I, I look at the trial and I think to myself, I, I, I can't even imagine the aftermath if this man is acquitted. Um, with with all that we know about what took place, even witnesses in his own police department uh, talking about the unnecessary force, et cetera. Um, we, we're losing the plot if we continue to put George Floyd on trial in his character uh, and and not think about what what has happened in that. I want to I want to keep with this theme for a moment before we get to the book, and I want to set the next question up. And I'm going to do this with a little bit of finesse, and it's going to take me a bit a bit of time to set this up. So bear with me, listeners. Bear with me here for a moment. Um, so I, one of the things that um, I sort of use the professional sports or the collegiate sports analogy. One of the things that professional sports do, professional collegiate teams do, is they they go through a, a process of self-scouting uh, where they kind of scout themselves, especially if a team is doing really well. They want to know the purpose of that exercise is to reveal any kind of blind spots or tendencies that can get overlooked as a season unfolds, right? So a team might uncover that, look, you know, we have a very obvious tendency on third and long that we always pass or we never, you know, we always run or something unfolds so that they can make sure that they're not predictable or they're not, you know, getting those blind spots. So I want to take that concept of self-scout uh, to the work in society around racial equity and cultural responsiveness. Um, look, we know that there aren't enough podcasts out there to talk about all the things that white people need to do to dismantle systemic racism. And I'm saying that because I want to be clear that what I'm about to ask you is not kind of veiled as a blame the victim uh, insinuation. So that's not where I'm going with this. But my question is this, you know, when you when you look at what's happened since May 25th of last year, um, and we know, of course, that the work in racial equity, and we just talked about Rodney King, we know this is not new. Uh, uh, this is a, an age old uh, challenge that society has faced, and, and particularly black people have faced. But certainly since last May, there was a, a, a flip in intensity around and and around the racial equity work and the anti-racist work. So there was a, to me, there was a seismic shift in the, in the collective consciousness about the importance of dismantling systemic racism. So here's where I'm going with this. When you look at the Black Lives Matter movement, or you look at individuals who are, are championing like yourselves and, and uh, Ibram Kendi, et cetera, who are, who are talking about the anti-racist work, if you were to self-scout the last year and think about the anti-racist work that has been happening since May of last year. Um, would, do you see any areas where 
there could have been maybe a different approach, a different strategy, that something might be preventing more progress and more permanent changes in our society at a more rapid pace. Thoughts on that? I know that was a long question, but I just yeah. looking reflectively, where, where might we find some blind spots and, and what can we do to sort of resolve those? No, no, it's, it's a very important question. And, I, and thank you for taking the time and care um, needed to ask the question because uh, it could be read as, as uh, one inviting critique of people who are on the front lines, who have devoted their lives to this work and who are learning to do this real time. They don't have time to stop and plan because they're in the middle of it. Middle of it. It's like you being on an airplane that's going down and you're trying to you know, you don't have time to go and read a couple of books and, you know, so um, I, 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 there, there are any number of ways to, to approach this question. And one could approach it as a private uh, activist, um, you know, who's, who's uh, been involved in the work. And, and I have, you know, I'm not a leader in that work, but I've definitely tried to show up anytime that um, broader communities are invited to that. Uh, one could uh, try to answer the question as a, some sort of social critic. Let me let me try to approach it as a scholar, um, and I and I and I would like to uh, call upon the Black radical tradition of many of the uh, Black and and then also um, you know Indigenous uh, freedom fighters who have been anti-colonial for 100 150 years. And one of the things that uh, as I see it, um, that they did, um, that I would like to encourage my brothers and sisters in the, in the movement and the Black Lives Matter and anti-racist movement is to, is to begin to imagine beyond critique. And so, of course, do we have to resist uh, police brutality? Of course, many of our leaders have been, have been talking about this. I mean, Malcolm X has maybe three or four speeches in which he talked specifically, like the title of the speech was police brutality. And this is like <laughs> 1963, 1962. Uh, Martin Luther King has talked about. So, so we've been talking about police brutality for 50 and 60 years. We've been critiquing housing discrimination for 75, 100 years. We've been critiquing uh, discrimination and racial oppression in schools. So we know how to critique. We have places from which we can critique, but what we don't have well figured out and what I would love to encourage from a place of love that my, for my brothers and sisters to encourage is what next? What do we do with the critique? What do we do as we critique? How are we building? Because if we're not, then the corollary and the suggestion is that all we want is a bigger piece of this pie. And, I, and some of us might want that, and some of us do not want that. And for me, for one, I want radical revolutionary change to much of what we see. Schools, uh, justice systems, political structures, all of that. And so if, if, if we're only critiquing, then we're saying we're okay with everything, we just want less pain. We want more access to resources. But everything else about this colonial project is fine. And, 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 and I'm just, uh, I, I don't think that uh, <clears throat> some of the anti-racist people have thought, that, thought about that. And that's necessary. You, you have to be kind of planning that as you deconstruct and you critique these various systems. I mean, I've, I do it in my work. Many of, many of the anti-racist scholars do it in their work. Um, activists are doing that. But I, 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 I rarely hear though, what is it that they are trying to build? Like what does community self-determination look like for the communities that you're advocating for? Um, this question is particularly insidious, and I, I'm being specific about the Twin Cities now, because there's a certain level of currency that comes with people being critical and critiquing up in the Twin Cities, um, regardless of if, if change happens or not, regardless of if there's another vision of, rea of, uh, of existence, of beauty, of humanity, all of those things that go to the very humanness of Black and Indigenous people. Uh, they have no notion of that, but as long as they step up, it could be a CEO who ignored it for 20 years. It could be a, a school superintendent who has never hardly speak, spoken at all. And they stand up and say, we need to do some racial equity work. And it's like, wow, superintendent of the year. Okay, this is the, he is the embodiment of what a CEO, a corporate suite, a C-suite leader should be. And it's like, hold on a second. The person has just said what we've been saying for 75 or 100 years. 
where's the, what is it, what is it, what does the plan look like? And so up in the Twin Cities, more than other places that I've lived in the country, and there's some other places like this too that I could say, but twin, the Twin Cities has this particularly bad. And so what that does is it develops a culture of hypocrisy, of people claiming that they, and I, I'm not laying this on the Black Lives Matter, by the way, but I'm just saying that this is the context of the Twin Cities. And when you look at Black Lives Matter in that, regard then you you'll have a lot more people even identifying and putting the sign in the yard and then when me as a black man walks by it's like calling the police what what wait hold on a second now what what kind of hypocrisy are we dealing with here right and so um so so i would just encourage of uh, folks who are doing the anti-racist work to also do what scholars call decolonial work or um ancestral work uh community-based work which means that they're building some in place of what has been so oppressive. Right. And I'll right. The, re, the reimagining of, of what it would look like. I think that, you know, it's something I, I've not thought of and I appreciate the response because I mean, it was kind of, I, I wasn't anticipating your answer, but it was kind of what I was asking was essentially, you know, what is, what is the, uh, what's the plan going forward? And I love that idea of reimagining a, a, a truly a new reality. Um, so let's pivot now to specifically the book, Culturally Responsive Leadership, and let's talk for the remainder of our time about schools and, and the work that needs to happen at the school level. Because, you know, again, some of the societal issues are beyond the realm of, of educators. They, they can certainly participate, but uh, in, in these societal issues around police brutality, that, that is a, a community conversation. That's a statewide conversation. That's a city conversation. But as far as schools are concerned... So, so along that thread, with the idea of the societal practices and policies, so you have, as we, as we mentioned, police brutality, you talk about uh, urban disinvestment, uh, you talk a, a lot about you know, highway expansion and how, it, how highway expansion often pushes into to Black neighborhoods and Black communities. So as an educational leader, you're a principal of a school or a district superintendent, those are issues that go far beyond your sphere of influence. So how do school leaders challenge the status quo and how do they push back against oppression? You, you know, I, I don't know that I agree that, that that is beyond the sphere of influence. I, I would agree that it is out of their pay scale responsibility. I, I would agree with that. But I've tried to be uh, very intentional about naming and raising up the legacy of principles in the modern era, as well as there are other people who do this in historic moments, uh, such as Vanessa Siddle Walker, Jerome Morris, and others mm -hmm. who, uh, who show how earlier Black leaders um, have served as community leaders as well. But in my, in my research, I try to uh, highlight uh, current leaders uh, who make it very, very, very much a part of their work to go out into communities that they serve and be influential there. Okay. Not to appropriate the work. In other words, you show up, that's not your issue, but you now care about that, which is good. That's, that's what we're asking you to do. But now you're the leader of that work. That's not what leaders need to do. Right. They need to, though, learn what is impacting their communities. I worked with um, one particular uh, district, Bloomington, uh, Minnesota, quite a bit. Uh, and Dina Wade Ardley and, and her team, just fabulous uh, educators who have put their lives in harm's way, uh, her and her team, uh, as well as other leaders across that district, um, to, to say emphatically that no, uh, yes, we, we, we are leaders in the building. So there, there, are, there are people in the modern era who are doing this. I, I write about Joe and much of my work, right. where if ICE is going to descend upon your district or police are going to come brutalize parents or children in your district, or if there's a lack of jobs, or if there are other kind of issues that you show up as advocates, not allies. I'm, 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 I'm a scholar. I know what word I'm using, and I'm not using, intentionally, I'm not using the word ally, okay? okay. I'm using the word advocate, because okay. now you have something, you have, you have a man in the fight. Right. Now you, I don't want to say dog in the fight. People are sensitive about dog fights. Fair but you see what I'm trying to say. Now you I have do. skin in the game. How, yeah. how about that? I, I yeah. don't know the history of that term. <laughs> yeah, but now you, you, you're invested. Right. Let's right. use that term. You're not lips. You're not hypocritical anymore. Now, right. because, because as you, you know this. I mean, Tom, yeah. leaders can be fired at any time for any reason. And they know right. that. Right. It happens all the time. 
you, your contract was renewed. You fell out with the superintendent. So that should be a non, whether or not your job is secure, because one gentleman who I write about extensively in my work, Joe, the district tried to fire him, but because he had the community connection, right? They were not able to. The, the community rose up time and time again. And I've written about cases across this country in which communities have risen up to protect their interest within and around schools. So, yes, your job is to be an instructional leader. Yes, your job is to uh, initiate new policies. Yes, your job is to lead uh, instruction, pedagogy, is to engage with community. Yes, I get all of that. But you, I would argue based on research, that your job is also to try to influence the issues around your school that impact the lives of who? The people you claim that you're serving. There, there's, a mind, there's a wall in the mind of educators that is imaginary. It really does not exist. There's nothing that can prevent us from going out there and doing that. So I don't mean to skirt your question, but I do want to just emphasize, as I do in my research, that your work is beyond the school walls. Your work is beyond educational issues. If your community is experiencing, you're in a rural Minnesota community and there's a high uh, rate of heroin or methamphetamine overdosing, you need to make that your issue. Yeah. Yes, it's not in the curriculum or in the policy, but that is what your people, these are humans. They have mm -hmm. humanness about them. And how can you show up and say, look, I don't care about all of the other humanity that this person is experiencing, jobs, whatever, healthcare. All I care about is it. Even though these things are preventing the education you claim you care about, and they're pre preventing you from having credibility, rapport, relationships with them, which is crucial to education. All these other issues that you're ignoring as an educator are preventing the things you claim you care about. Mm -hmm. It's really ironic to see educators or leaders show up and claim that they're not going to deal with any of the other stuff in the community or advocate for that or put their careers on the line for that. And most of that is imaginary too. Most times people who have gone out and advocated for stuff, even I've seen some people stand up against ICE in their district, they're not fired. I mean, yeah. come on, let's get real about that. Right, right. That is a fear that they're carrying and it never happens. Yeah. And so they're here claiming that they only care about edu you know, education and and then they're leaving all other aspects of humanity. And so I think that educators should start there and go right. into communities, not just physically, but even emotionally, epistemologically, psychologically, yeah. psychologically yeah. and all of that. Yeah. Well, first, Professor, let me let me say I appreciate the correction on the on the question for sure, because, uh, you know, it, what I intended to say was beyond their pay grade. But I really appreciate your response and, and the pushback on the way that I phrased the question, because I think that's a really good point. And I and I think that leaders can sometimes fall into that trap. And I probably fell into that trap when I crafted the question. So I, I really do appreciate. And the other piece I want to pick up on just in reflection of your response is, I have ha have not yet heard that distinction between ally and advocate kind of phrased that way, and I really do appreciate the distinction between you know. Uh, so, would it be your sort of contention that to be an ally would be to to do things, but to do it passively? You know, it's post a black square on Instagram. It's 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 retweet a a quote or a or something. Whereas an advocate is you're invested in the work. Is that is that the distinction? Am I drawing a correct distinction between the two? <laughs> You, you are. And that would look like like you're, you're, we're in a meeting. Somebody says something that's wild against, um, you know, let's say you're serving a Somali family yeah. and you stand up for them, Tom, in the meeting. And here I am in the meeting and I hear it. You might see a little gesture from me, but I don't say anything while you're excoriated by, by the leaders in the building. And then on break, we, we're in the bathroom and I say, you know, Tom, you really had a good point. But wait on a second. Mohammed, your question should be, Mohammed, wh why are we in the bathroom? Right. relieving ourselves and now you mentioned that now right mm -hmm. why did you say that in the meeting right. so allyship allows you to play safe it allows you to gauge the level that you will support something if it's politically expedient then you can show up if it might be politically uh more spurious or damaging then you hold back and you are in secret or to the extent that's comfortable for you supportive of that Advocates don't don't do that. Advocates are one hundred percent all of the time, fully in. They're visibly in. Uh, they don't just use their uh, political capital, but economic, physical, whatever they have 
yeah. to show that they are 100% behind this issue as though it was their own issue, because in many ways it is. Yeah. You, you talk a lot about epistemology, and I think for, for some listeners, uh, and f- generally for all of us who, who don't take the, as deep a dive as you do, um, what, what is epistemology and why, from your perspective, as you write in the book, is it so critical for those engaged in anti-racist and anti, anti-bias work? Why okay. is that so important? A- absolutely. Well, the reason it's so important is because anti-bias work has largely been a failure for schools. I've, I, let, 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 me, let, me, let me explain what I mean by that so people don't walk away with the wrong, wrong idea because I don't, I don't want anybody to walk away misquoting me saying that they should not do anti-bias work. They should do something. They should do that as well. But the question that epistemological scholars and people who dive and dive in epistemology ask is, where are those biases from? Why are you merely addressing biases and not interrogating more deeply like what are causing those biases to show up like that Mm -hmm. and that's why i I don't think that anti-bias work is a a starting place um i think that once you have a good understanding of what is causing the biases to show up because i've been in districts more than one who have done anti-bias work for years in the numbers around disproportionalities racial disproportionalities and other uh disproportionalities continue to show up past the anti-bias work. Now, epistemology asks, what are the knowledges? What are the experiential frames? What are, how, what is everything that's in your mind that you pull on in order to define and interpret what you're seeing in the world? So like to, to bring it into schools, principals every day, every day at every moment have to make decisions about things around them. And less of it is about policy and more of it is about interpretation of policy. Because I've seen principals say, now, nah, you know, I know it's aunt and we've talked about this. Now, there's a policy in place. Yeah. But I see them every day, all day say, no, nah, well, well, you know, that's not going to work. The parent, we, we talked to the mother. Blah, blah. So now they navigate and negotiate around policies all the time. Mm-hmm. So it's not, a, it's not a policy question that I'm talking about right now. I'm talking about a practice question. I'm talking about how do you, so like you're standing in a school, Mary walks up, Mary says, look, I can't have Deshaun in my class anymore. Deshaun is disrespectful, All right? Deshaun comes up and says, Mary, she doesn't like me. You go to Deshaun as a principal. On a split second, you have to pull knowledge in order to know who to believe, right. in order to understand what, what is disrespectful and what's not disrespectful. Like all of these decisions have to be made And educators are able to, and leaders in particular, are able to come to schools and act as though they don't have these repertoires of knowledge, right? That they use to interpret and believe Mary in this incidence more and Deshaun in that incidence more. And usually they're believing Mary and not Deshaun, which is why we have the achievement gap uh, and, and the discipline gap. Now, epistemology, getting more specific. It's, it comes out of a branch of philosophy, but I won't bore you with that conversation. But uh, uh, what it is, is, is conversations that we've heard as a child. I mean, we've got to really dig deep. It's comic strips, books that we've read, just how we were shamed by our grandmothers or our aunts. You know, you don't do that, boy. So, all, so now you're in school saying, we don't do that. But hold on a second. Why, why don't we do that? I do that. You mean you don't do that because your grandmother who was white from Germany originally, told you not to do that. And that's bad. And that's disrespectful. And that's loud. See, all of these terms that I'm mentioning, bad, Mm -hmm. disrespectful, loud, he's a genius. All of these terms come from a specific historic moment in history. And I'm sorry, but you're white and you're middle class and I'm black and I'm poor and he's indigenous and he's from the res. And guess what? Everybody's definition of loud of bad. All of that differs. But how do you add meaning to yours? Well, you pull from your history. That's why we talk about epistemology. And now you can Mm -hmm. see the complexity of what I'm saying and why bias work, Mm -hmm. which is led by data usually. The data looks like this. Well, what are our biases? Now, hold on a second. That's part of it. The other thing that epistemology does is something that I refer to in the book as critical self-reflection. The first two chapters in the book are really framing everything that will all of the later chapters in the book. So critical self-reflection allows us to see epistemology, allows us to see bias in a a much more broader 
uh, right. perspective than it's talked about now. Mm -hmm. Tom, mostly in schools, people show up and they just merely want to talk about their own personal racial autobiographies or racial biographies or whatever. And that is important. But in the academy and in the book, we talk about multiple spaces that you need to interrogate. So one of them is personal, but another one is, this, is uh, sy systemic. Another one is community engaged, right? Another one is behavioral. So you have all of these different spheres where you need to ask the question differently. The question, this is the same question, but it, it, it reshapes in each of these spheres. But the same question is, how am I reproducing oppressive context for these people that I serve right. as, a, as a person, as a leader? How's the data? How's the community engaged aspect of that? So you're asking the same question, but in sort of like in different spaces of the work you do. And that's deeply uh, you know, connected to epistemology too, because one thing that I'm not saying, yes, th are there epistemologies that all middle-class white people might share? Yes, there likely is. Are there epistemologies that Black working class people might share? Yes. Are there epistemologies that most wealthy people might share? Yes. All of these things are true. So I don't take the position in the book necessarily that epistemology is bad. Everybody just has it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just like the way you walk, right? right? You, you, the way you walk is not worse than mine. The way you walk might run down my carpet more, the way you walk might rub, run down your hip bones or whatever more. But what I, what I do say though, what I do critique and what I am sensitive about is you showing up with power. Now remember all educators and administrators in schools have a, a bit of power to interpret the policy as you see it, to enforce the policy when you want to or to ignore it when you want to, right? All of these things are aspects of power. So what I do critique is for you to show up in schools with that power, and now you're acting like you don't have an epistemology. That's the problem. Yeah. Not, not, I mean, of course, all of us have some things about our epistemology that we need to check. No doubt about that. Right. But that's not the point I'm making in the book. In the book, I'm saying, look, now you're showing up with your epistemology and you're not interrogating it. You're only doing bias where you're not interrogating deeply of like where these biases are coming from. Yeah. And you're acting like you're a neutral arbitral and you're just looking at the policy. Well, no, nope, now Deshaun, you did such and such. But no, that's got epistemology written all over it. Yeah. And you're but, acting like you don't have one and only Deshaun has one. And so that's kind of um, what, where I go with that. That, that is such a, a great segue into the next question, because I want to talk about uh, the residual effect of culturally responsive schools, culturally responsive leadership. And I'm imagining that as this work, you know, expands within a school, I'm imagining uh, a more expansive space for my minoritized students, for sure. When you think about, we, we talked earlier about what has typically been defined as good behavior. Um, you know, the idea of the key, you talk about widening the space and having a real and permanent impact on the disproportionate ways in which black, brown, indigenous children, students, teenagers are disciplined, that, that the school discipline approach has really been defined through that white Eurocentric lens, and that what is traditionally good behavior in school is really defined through that narrowness. And I'm, I'm imagining that as this culturally responsive work, you know, widens the space, we'll start to see uh, an impact on that. Your thoughts on that? I, I agree with that. I agree with that because it's also uh, something of a bit of invisibilization process that happens. And what I mean by that is to say that wh while, what you, why, while what you said is true and while what I say is true, obviously, it's obvious to me that leaders don't see how they're doing this. It's mm -hmm. not apparent to them. They look at the data. They're frightened by the data. They know what's happening. They're indications. They hear student voice. They hear parent voice complaining. They know what's happening but they don't see how and they don't know how it's happening. And it happens in a number of ways. Some of it is more explicit, exclusionary. Some of it is implicit. So like uh, explicit, we know, right? We, we see that. We see the referrals. We can go. One of the things we do in the academy is we take things like those referrals and we say, okay, now this is a referral. A parent disagreed with you. A student disagreed with you. But you and your teacher felt this way. Historicize not just the parent. Historicize not just the student, but historicize yourselves in the school. Mm -hmm. Why did you come to this meaning for this? 
artifact or for this referral or whatever. But it, it doesn't only happen through uh, explicit means as well, right? It happens implicitly. Like, you know, I'm not, you, you, you know, like there's a lot of uh, conversation, for example, one example, is it happens with gifted and talented courses. So there are serious problems across Minnesota and almost every district that I've visited and I'm familiar with the data in which the gifted and talented or advanced classes, you know, don't have many people of color in there. Black and indigenous are very rare, right? Mm -hmm. And then what happens when you find that, I've, we've done equity audits, so we know, we've talked to these students. What happens when you do have a child from a family or maybe not, from any particular type of family, just a genius, right? A genius child who wasn't discouraged from enrolling, even though they were qualified to do that. They had that one teacher who, white teacher, who saw the promise and benefit and said, you know what, I'm not going to discourage you. I know it's a wide practice in this district to smart black kids to discourage them from going into gifts and talent. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to find the promise in you and I'm going to make sure you're in there. Then the child shows up there, right? And then they get an A on the test and the teacher. Well, Deshaun, I'm sorry for picking on Deshaun so much in this session. <laughs> <laughs> I had a close friend, Deshaun. I love him. Though. There you go. Back in Michigan. Yeah. Deshaun has gotten an A. Look at all of you. So now you're tokenizing. Yeah. You're exoticizing. You're doing all of these things mm -hmm. to cause this kind of attention. So now you're exclusionary toward them without even knowing it. You might even think you're being benevolent. Right. Right. And so what, what it takes is a deep dive into all of the indicators that students, not that you, but that students use to measure your climate. Right. Right. How are students making? I don't care. I come. One of the questions I ask when I'm when I'm talking to groups of administrators and teachers is how is your school climate? How comfortable are students? And I, I, I'm listening to what they say, but I'm also listening critically what they say. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, they're, if they're not ever saying, well, we use a systematic approach in order to ask the people, because most of them say, well, I have a good relation. It's always I and my interpretations and my epistemological orientations around how I understand whether a school is comfortable or not. But I, I don't, I mean, you have power. You're, you're fine. You're, you're, you're okay. I'm more worried about students and by extension, the communities uh, that are coming, how do they interpret something? And are they just telling you what you want to hear when you ask them, which uh, many, many professors have found that students do. They, they, you ask them, do you like it here? They say, yeah, I love it here. I love it here. Right. Because they know that's what you want to hear. Right. Some students do that. Some will be brutally honest with you. Thank God. So, uh, <laughs> so, so th th there are many, yeah. many aspects to this question. We can go deeper with it if you'd like, yeah. but that's yeah. Bit, yeah. What um what let, let, let's stick with this theme for a moment here. Uh, you know, let's say let's imagine I'm a principal. Mary brings me Deshaun, and Mary says, you know, Deshaun was disruptive, uh, and, and Deshaun says she doesn't like me. What can I do in that moment? So I'm I'm in that situation. I don't have hours to reflect. I kind of have to deal with this in in a relatively short period of time. What are maybe some some questions I could ask myself as as, as the principal sitting in that room? thinking to myself, okay, you know, how, how would I recognize that, that some of that is affecting my decision-making without even realizing that, that my, my background, my bias, all, all of that is affecting that. What are some of the things that I could do to explore that? Well, one thing that you could do is, is not give an uh, answer on the spot. Another thing that you could do is, is I mean, most, most leaders I know do have uh, teachers in the school that they know get it, who are committed to the work. So people like that are natural mentors for people like Mary, who mm -hmm. uh, obviously might be trying to figure something out. Um, and then uh, it, it, it is, it, I hate to say this, because I know you, you indicated in the question, you don't have a lot of time for reflecting and reading and stuff like that. But in order to unlearn, one has to learn. Yeah. There's no other way around that. I, I've not seen it happen. Every other thing that I could recommend to you is, would just be a quick fix. I mean, you have superintendents across Minnesota that have tried quick fixes without doing the deep learning right. that's, that's necessary in order to unlearn practice. Mm -hmm. One scholar and good friend of mine said, it took me 20 years to unlearn what it only took me 10 years to learn. Right. So unlearning takes time. Epistemological mm -hmm. engagement takes time. And so I know we don't have a lot of time, so it has to be planned and charted out because the, the, the reality is, is that 
if Mary had the proper training and the proper guidance and the proper mentoring, she would have never showed up at your office with that. That's where, that's where you want to get to when you see when you begin to see real cultural change. Because I could easily tell you to say, all right, let's let's have a mediation se session. Let's go to PBIS. Let's let's have a, a, a three person mentoring. Session. But like, you know, you might have 35 or 40 principals in the building. You, don't, you cannot do like you don't have that kind of time that would that would consume all of your time as a leader. Right. So the, the, the real and, and this is what I hope leaders take away from this, that, look, it would be more taxing on me to continue to do things the way I'm doing anyway, even from a cost benefit analysis perspective. If I continue to do things like this, it it's going to be more costly to me anyway. I may as well invest the time and do a whole staff journey training with the right people, with the right readings. And then at that point, Mary does not show up like that. Deshaun may show up like that because he probably has good reason to believe that Mary doesn't like him. But Deshaun doesn't work for you. Right, <laughs> Deshaun no. is being served by you. That's so that's right. a big difference with that. Yeah, it's a, that's a massive difference for sure. And I think the, the, <laughs> the uh, you know, sometimes like you're the only adult in the room. Like, let's think this through here. Uh, and, and I think your point is, is really well taken in that, you know, there's that adage that always suggests that being proactive is more efficient and effective than being reactive. And I think the first step is that level of awareness and then beginning to engage in the work so that you're not put in that position where you have to make an acute decision, um, you know, within a matter of, you know, an hour or two, because Mary has brought this uh, sort of intense kind of uh, situation to the forefront. So um, I think we could, we could probably spend a whole podcast just talking about student discipline and culturally responsive. So uh, maybe I will use that as an excuse to have you back. Uh, and we'll talk just about that. But I want to finish up with a couple of things. I want to talk about the leader's role in developing uh, culturally responsive so this kind of is a, is a segue with the story about Mary, culturally responsive teachers and culturally responsive curriculum. What's the leader's role in uh, bringing about this? You argue that this is crucial, that a leader's role is to, to both bring about, you know, culturally responsive teachers and curriculum. So how do leaders go about doing that? Well, now we get into the nuts and bolts of what people see themselves as, as leaders, as school leaders, right? So it's the yeah. whole curriculum and pedagogy. And so I, I argue that, not surprisingly, so the way that equity work has happened until now is that folks, leaders show up in schools, superintendents and districts, and they think that they have the one day in which they look at uh, data. Then they have another day where they invite a high profile leader in, uh, or I'm sorry, speaker, leader, whatever, to, in yeah. order to talk about race. And they think that perhaps through osmosis, I don't know what they're thinking, but they think that somehow this racial knowledge that they've gained is somehow going to seep into walkthroughs, hiring, budgeting, scheduling, all of these kind of recruitment into gifted and talented, pipeline to college. They think that somehow, somehow, that all of this racial stuff that they've learned in the one day, you know, that they've had or whatever, is somehow going to infuse itself into leadership work, school leadership work. And guess what? It never does. Right. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> and so um, what we argue and what we try to, what we do in the academy, we have like maybe seven or eight activities in the academy where we do offer, uh, there's a, there's, there's a, um, a principal up in uh, Roseville, uh, Mary, Dr. Mary Busman, who uh, worked with us and, 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 and others. But what she worked on specifically is a culturally responsive observation tool, right? Mm -hmm. And we say, like, we don't give you this to go into uh you know, your schools and say, okay, now we got this tool. No, we're giving you this. We have another protocol we use. We have a curriculum, a culturally responsive curriculum check. We have all of these things that we give you and say, now, you don't have to use this tool, but use this tool to critique what you have. Because the problem is, and I'm going to get more specific in a minute with your question, but I'm still at a general moment yeah. right now. The problem is, is that people kind of, uh, have these different tools right now that they use in their district and whether or not the tool is checking for cultural responsiveness is an optional part of the tool. So for example, you can use the Danielson framework and you can go in and it could be, you know, a black male teacher who's ignoring all of his Somali female students, right? You can mark everything positive with Danielson or Mozano or some of the other tools that you use. 
despite the fact that he is in, you know, maybe knowingly, maybe unknowingly, I don't know. I mean, that's, that's, that's beside the point to some extent when it comes to the lives of children, but he is somehow marginalizing all of these Muslim Somali female girls in his class. Now, hold on a second. How, how can he be using, he be evaluated on a walkthrough or a, a four hour observation in a classroom and he's, and he, he is uh, explicitly marginalizing towards, so that's something that should never happen. So all of the tools we introduce in the academy and the work that is in the book and the suggestions in the book is that no, it's not that equity happens here and then leadership here and just leave the leader to figure out how to, no, you need to have policies, you need to have tools, you need to have processes that reflect the equity day that you had. Mm -hmm. So every single process, how you monitor, how you look at curriculum, how you select curriculum, how you select text, what the curriculum should be, all of that has to have, you know, if so, some people do professional learning community work. So that means that the PLC work, you have to have of the four broad questions, we do this in the academy too, you have to have sub questions that respond to and reflect cultural responsiveness at every single level of leadership and at every tool and in every policy. And so that's kind of, um, so, so, I mean, so the, there, there are many activities that we do in order to ensure that, but uh, uh, we do have, you know, curriculum, culturally responsive curriculum checks that we do in the academy. Yeah. Yeah. We have culturally responsive evaluation tools. We have culturally res responsive PLC activities. And all of these things, we, we don't do the entire activity in the academy, but we do an hour uh, or longer as much as we can because we got a lot of stuff to cover uh, so, that so that leaders begin to get a practice of how to do this work in their buildings and in, in their schools to, in order to make the pedagogy curriculum, the classroom climate, we have a couple of activities on that to make them all more culturally responsive. Yeah. So that's a great way to... Uh to segue again into uh, sort of the final, not question, but opportunity for you, because I did want to give you the opportunity to kind of promote the, the Culturally Responsive Leadership Institute. T you've told us a little bit about the content and the curriculum that, that you kind of follow in the Institute. What are some of the logistical things? Like, you know, when is it hosted? Can, can you yeah. share with listeners, if they're interested in the Institute, um, just what are some of the logistics around it and, and kind of how does it work when you, once you register? Sure. It, well, it is in high demand now. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's really taken off. We're doing it in multiple states. Uh, we're, coming, we're coming to Minnesota uh, maybe two or three times this year um, remaining, you know. Yeah. Uh, we, we were doing uh, virtual, but now we're kind of transitioning back face to face now that people are more comfortable with that. We, we've done it in rural areas. We've done it in northern and southern Minnesota. Yeah. We've done it urban. We've done uh, suburban. Um, and what it is, is 2.5 days of deep learning. So folks are going to be asked to read the book in its entirety, um, which is a good thing. I mean, learning yeah. is a good thing. Every single profession out there, learning is a regular part of it. And I think it should be a part of this too. Um, and then there are 10 or so other articles. My, um, my, uh, my partner and colleague and close friend, Dr. Katie Pakel, uh, co-leads with me. Katie is a principal in residence at the University of Minnesota. And I'm, mm -hmm. I'm still affiliated with the University of Minnesota myself. I'm um, uh, through Cary Institute. And okay. um, yep, so uh, I'm a senior equity fellow there. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm still in town quite a bit. But Dr. Katie Pakel uh, and I, Dr. Katie Pakel and I go back and forth quite a bit because I would like the article list to be more like 20 to 25. And she's like, Muhammad, <laughs> that's not going to happen. <laughs> Your limit is 10 articles. But anyway, we have a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, 2.5 days of deep learning. Um, we would prefer to have it together, but we have broken it up uh, in the mm -hmm. past, like one day, day one, day two, and then 2.5 at another, uh, day 0.5 at another right. uh, moment. But we prefer, we think it's more powerful if it's all together. Uh, and in addition to the reading, though, uh, not not to scare folks, the things that are more exciting is that we ask them to be, bring loads of artifacts, uh, data sets, um, and other things that can help them deeply the policies. You know, we do critiques and policy analysis mm -hmm. uh, tools, uh, discourse analysis tools, and stuff like that, so that we can really have this deep learning. And and, and we've had some superintendents come back three, four times for it. Um, associate yeah. superintendents. Uh, principles because it's such a rich learning opportunity. Um, we have their, or, their organizations or districts up in um, Minnesota in which we, um, they, they, whenever they have new leaders that they hire, they send them to us. Um, 
Right. You know, we've worked with Project Success. So that's a nonprofit that serves Minneapolis public schools. They're doing great work uh, with Sister Adrian up there. And so uh, there are a lot of uh, folks who really believe in the work and we're happy about that because we do too. And we, we think that equity work cannot remain in the realm of uh, being sort of interpersonal. That is an important aspect of it, but it, until systemic change, so the focus of this is systemic change. And it's so beautiful when you get these leaders from different spaces, all bringing what they do well and bringing their vulnerabilities and what the, where they need to learn more and sharing that, that even the cross like pollination of knowledge that happens right. is, 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 very, is a very powerful aspect of it. But uh, with all of the data, the tools, the policies, the artifacts that they bring and then the reading, it gives, a, and then the activities that we've planned, that we've carefully planned and selected, it, it really gives a, a chance for leaders because usually leaders don't get this opportunity in most right. districts. We, right. they, we, they told us, we, this, is, this, this is our first opportunity for learning and it's the most powerful learning that I've had since I started college as an undergrad. I mean, those are the kind of comments that come out of this because there are so many opportunities to begin to enact system change and to learn and be vulnerable and be courageous that, um, it's really unparalleled, I think. Yeah. yeah. So listeners, uh, I will put a link in the show notes for uh, the website. So if you're interested in the information or to register or to join in on, on the work, uh, that'll be there for you. And one last um, aspect of your work that I want to give you a chance to talk about is the equity audit that is available also to school leaders and schools. Uh, talk a little bit about that. Yes, yes, absolutely. So, the, So an equity audit is... In our view. So, you know, you should know that there are different ways that people approach equity audits. When, when, when my colleagues across the country in different spaces first started to talk about the equity audits, um, what they did is that they thought that discussing trend equity data is where it should start and where it should end. And I don't agree with that. Um, so we're online at adjusted.org and for the culturally responsive school leadership institute at crsli.org CRSLI but what 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 equity audits uh, can provide in our view is uh, root cause analysis and so in other words if you have someone like a dave Highstead who is in bloomington we work we work closely with them or another good like psychometrician or data expert on your staff you don't need somebody to bring all of the equity data into a nice worksheet for you to see. I mean, why would you pay somebody to do that? What you rather have is some, a scholar like myself, and I work with an expansive team to, do, to get this done, is to go and to show you why your data is looking like that year after year. Not if it's looking like that, because you would not be calling us if, it, if you did not already know that. You know that your data looks like that. Now, it is something to be said about pulling all of the different, because, you know, again, it's, 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 it sounds so intuitive, but I've seen districts focus on discipline data one day and then focus on attendance data. Why don't our students want to be here who are from certain backgrounds, enrollment and attendance, and then focus on disciplinary and then academic, and then focus on extracurricular. And then, now, why would you be talking about all of these different, I mean, what can you see when you look at all of this at one time? So there is something to be said about looking at the trend data, but you know it's there. Why don't you talk about why it's there? So that's what we've developed. We've developed surveys for students, parents, uh, teachers, and administrators. Wait, yeah, students, parents, teachers, and administrators. Sometimes cabinet will take the administrative survey and then uh, board members for districts will take that as well. But then it gives us why these disproportionalities continue to happen year after year, what you're doing well, what you're not doing well, where you should start the equity work, right? So that's why we often recommend folks do the academy and do the equity audit so that number one, they, they have the tools to begin to enact changes when they see the equity data, but then they know what they're doing well already. They know what they can prioritize. They know what's cheaper. They know it's gonna take five years. You know, They have some meaning about how to prioritize their equity work. And without an equity audit, it's like shooting in the dark. Yeah. Oh, uh, we heard that that district did PBIS. So we heard that they did uh, check and connect. And we heard that they did restorative justice. Let's do those three things. And then you look up in three years from now, nothing has changed nothing because they were not intentional about how they selected reform. Mm -hmm. They were, I'm, I don't mean a discount. I should say they were not academic. They were intentional, right? I mean, educators are working. I'm, I am not here 
trying to slam educators. Both of my parents were retired educators. I was an educator in Detroit public schools for years. I love educators and I'm a professor of education. I love it. But there are, are there ways to be more academic and to become smarter about how we implement uh, scientifically implement this stuff? Are there ways to become smarter? I, can we know what we have already excelled at, what we're doing well, how we can invest there? Can we know about the things that will take one or two years and it's not a heavy investment? Can we know about the things where we know we got to make a significant financial and time investment and it's going to take five years in order to enact and see this change come out? Can we have conversations about that? And equity audits empower educators to have just like those kind of conversations. Um, and you can find all of the work we do online. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and we would, we would love, we've already partnered with many districts across Minnesota, and we would love to continue to do that in any right. capacity. We'll, we will, uh, I'll, I'll mention those websites one more time as we finish up. Uh, uh, fantastic. Uh, this uh, listeners, the book is Culturally Responsive leader, School Leadership. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. No, I was yeah. going to say Culturally Responsive School Leadership. School Leadership. Yeah, I, yeah that's good. See, you're always a professor, always correcting me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, culturally responsive school leadership, it is a fantastic read. Uh, I could not be more impressed uh, with your work. And I really appreciate you uh, being here. But we've got a couple of more things we got to get to. And we've had a pretty intense, heavy conversation. And it's it's necessary because the work is, is ongoing and it needs to continue. But we're going to finish up with uh, a couple of uh, lighter notes. Uh, we're going to talk here first about... Uh, thinking about some fun and a segment that I call three questions where we're going to give people a chance to get to know you a little bit on a more personal level. And then we're going to finish up with one more question about success and happiness. So you can take these questions wherever you want to. Uh, you, you just, you know, they'll, they'll offer you some choices and we'll get a little insight as to where, where Dr. Khalifa is. So here's the first one. You know how people always say, do you want the good news or the bad news? So would you rather hear the good news first or the bad news first? <laughs> oh, oh my God. I, 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 I think I want to hear the bad news first because I don't think I can live with myself as I'm waiting. I mean, I'm, I'm a nervous wreck. <laughs> I would be sitting there like, just give it to me. Just, just give, it, give to it to me. me. I know. <laughs> give me the bad news first. And then uh, hopefully if it's too bad, we can end with, we can, the, the good news will brighten the bring it, brighten bring it the back home mood. that's yeah. right okay second one would you rather have nosy neighbors or noisy neighbors oh my god oh my god <laughs> <laughs> you named the worst two possible <laughs> the worst gotta of pick, all is gotta pick nosy. one. <laughs> oh god uh well, damn, I got to be able to sleep at night. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to use that word. Uh, <laughs> it's okay. I, I got to be able to sleep at night, but man, I cannot stand nosy people. I guess give me the nosy ones. Get, uh, the, the, noisy God. or nosy? Nosy? <laughs> nosy. Give me the nosy neighbor. <laughs> They're going to want to know. Uh, be all up in your business. All right. Uh, last one. Uh, would you rather take an action-packed European vacation, of course, post-COVID, would you rather take an action-packed European vacation or spend two weeks at the same resort in the Caribbean? Caribbean. Yeah. Caribbean, yes. Absolutely. Just type B, lay out in the, just enjoying the relaxing time. Yep. Oh, man. Let me get sunburned. Let me see. I, I'm missing some of my melanin. You know, my melanin has not come back yet because it's been the winter. So I got to get that melanin. Just That's lay right. up. Give me the drink. Let me get it. Yeah. You li living in Minnesota and Ohio, you need to move somewhere else for sure. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Okay. That's right. All right. Let's finish up with one final question because I know we got to get you out of here. Um, and I really appreciate you taking the time. But my final question to you is a question I ask all of the interviewers or interviewees, I should say, all, all of the people that have been on the podcast so far. And it's a theme I'm trying to run through the podcast about success and happiness. So the question I want to ask you is the same question, which is if a random person stopped you on the street and said, what's your definition of success? How would you answer them? What is success to you? Success to me is, I think my, mainly comes into two, two areas. One of them is the ability to, to live out your full humanity and to be content with that. Mm -hmm. um, success to me is to be, it's not, I, I, we know billionaires who are not happy. It's not money. We, we know people who are very accomplished and who take their own lives. We know people who, um, you know, have been at the top and they fall. And because their identity was connected to that and not, not uh, to their own humanity and their own worth, 
Um, you know, so being content, knowing who you are and being content with that is, is part of success. And then the other part um, of that is being able to positively um, influence others to become more human as well. So being if something, it does not have, you don't have to be an educator, you don't have to be a doctor, you don't have to be an advocate, but just even with your children, just able to leave other humans at wide or small scales, other humans with the ability to also connect with who they are as humans and what, whatever that might mean. It's some, for some people it's spiritual, for some people it's, right. it's cultural, yeah. historic, whatever that might mean for you. Wow. Well, that is a, uh, a great way to think about just in terms of being content versus, you know, it doesn't mean we're complacent, but we are content with who we are. And I, I love that. Um, Muhammad, I thank you so much for being here today. Listeners, uh, I would really encourage you to follow Dr. Muhammad on, on uh, uh, Twitter. Uh, his handle is at School Equity Pro, exactly as it's spelled, School Equity Pro. Uh, the Equity Audit, you'll find that at www.adjusted.org. That's the website for the Equity Audit. And of course, yeah. the Cultural, Cultural, Culturally Responsive School Leadership Institute, www.crsli.org as well. Uh, Mohammed, any other websites, yes. uh, things you yeah, want to mention? Yeah. I, I, we, we, I, I spell, we intentionally spelled adjusted with, without the first D. I, I, we do know how to spell, but it was supposed to be shorthand for oh, yeah. a just education. So it's a J. Just, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. My, my apologies. Oh, www.ajusted.org. Uh, yeah, I guess I just default to, to the spelling. No, you, I, I know you know how to spell, <laughs> but I appreciate it. That's good, good to know. And, and certainly we'll make uh, that website link available uh, in the, uh, in the show notes. Uh, Mohammed, I, I can't thank you enough for, for being here today. Uh, I truly appreciate uh, the, your insights and, and, uh, the, and the continued work that you're doing. And I've certainly learned a lot today, and I know listeners have as well. So thank you so much. Thanks for the invitation. It's been such a joy to be with you, Tom. In Assessment Corner this week, I want to talk about homework. And we're going to start the conversation about homework this week and finish it up next week. There are a couple of main issues, I think, when it comes to homework. Uh, and then, of course, underneath those, there are a number of different smaller issues and, and more of the minutia that we have to think about. But they kind of fall under the umbrella of the two issues or topics. One is what role does homework play in learning? And two, should homework contribute in any way to a student's achievement grade? So let's talk about the first one. Now, in keeping with today's don't at me, uh, homework is a topic for which there are a variety of perspectives. You know, if you randomly select 10 teachers, you'll probably have 10 perspectives on homework. Now, that term itself, homework, has come to mean almost anything completed at home. And therein lies the first problem with any assertion about homework. Unless we have a common understanding of what type of homework is being assigned, it's starting to feel a little bit like apples and oranges when you, when you talk about comparisons. So the great homework debate, of course, has been raging for the entirety of my 30-year career, and I'm quite confident it was in full swing long before my career got started. I'm going to begin by dismissing the extreme positions, to be honest. Uh, you know, look, to the always or never crowd, it's just not a credible position from my perspective. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, beginning any sentence in assessment, anything related to assessment with the words always or never, uh, even homework is usually wrong and usually an exaggeration. Homework is one of those topics where you'll probably find the point of view you're looking for. If you're a staunch anti-homework person, then you're probably going to gravitate to someone like Alfie Cohen. A more balanced approach to homework and you'll gravitate to Duke University's Harris Cooper. Uh, now Harris Cooper has done uh, many studies and, and several meta-analyses. But I want to begin with one of my favorite quotes about homework, and it comes from Kathy Vaderot. Now, Kathy is a professor of education at the University of Missouri in St. Louis. Her nickname is the Homework Lady because uh, she wrote the book uh, Rethinking Homework, Best Practices That Support Diverse Needs. In the book, Kathy writes, quote, The value of the research is in the broad strokes it paints, not in the minutiae. Its value comes as we reflect on the logic of its conclusions. Do they make sense for our population of students? Are they consistent with what we've come to know from experience about the type and age of students we teach? The other value is to dispel myths behind some of the most strongly held beliefs about homework. 
When we look at research, we have to be thoughtful consumers. Again, Harris Cooper, professor of psychology, said that the research synthesis he led showed the positive correlation was much stronger for secondary students, right? Secondary students being from grades 7 to 12 than those in elementary school. Cooper suggests a number of reasons why older students benefit more from homework than younger students. And the first is, uh, he says that younger children are less able than older children to tune out distractions in their environment. Younger children also, he says, have less effective study habits. But the reason, he says, also could have to do with why elementary teachers assign homework. Perhaps, he says, it's used more often to help young students develop better time management skills and study skills, not to immediately affect their achievement in particular, but to help them grow in those study skills, even though John Hattie has asserted that the research supporting that claim doesn't really exist. So Cooper says this, quote, kids burn out. He says the bottom line really is all kids should be doing homework, but the amount and type should vary according to their developmental level and their home circumstances. Homework for young students should be short, lead to success without much struggle, occasionally involve parents, and when possible, listen to this part, use out-of-school activities that kids enjoy, such as their sports teams or high-interest reading, end quote. Now, Cooper points out that there are limitations to the current research on homework. For instance, he says little research has been done to assess whether a student's race, socioeconomic status, or ability level affects the importance of homework in his or her particular achievement. So there are limitations to the research. So this comes back to Kathy Vaderot's suggestion, right? Does the research make sense for our population of students? Are they consistent with what we have come to know from experience about the type and the age of students that we work with. So homework in John Hattie's research had a 0.29 effect size. Not huge, but not nothing. And the debate is not whether we should give it or not, but making sure really Hattie asserts that homework reinforces learning. Now Cooper suggests that his research does align with what many assert is the 10-minute rule right? So whatever grade the student is in, you multiply by 10, and that's the number of minutes. So, you know, if you're in first grade, then um, there would be 10 minutes of, of homework, if you will. Uh, if you're in the fifth grade, there would be 50 minutes. And if you're in the 12th grade, there's two hours. But remember, Hattie says, work that reinforces learning. Cooper says, use out-of-school activities that kids enjoy, such as their sports teams or high-interest reading. So the emphasis here would be on quality, not quantity. So the 50 minutes for a grade five student need not be packets or just questions from a textbook, right? The 10 minute rule doesn't say assign anything you want. We still have to ensure that what we're asking students to do is, you know, meaningful and extends learning. So you have a first grade student who might have 10 minutes of homework and you say, well, it's absurd, but we're, we're not suggesting they don't do 10 minutes of home reading or literacy development, right? Stanford researcher Denise Pope found, on the other hand, too much homework can negatively affect kids, especially their lives away from school, where family, friends, and activities also matter. So too much homework is linked to you know, greater stress, uh, reduction in health, and obviously less time with family, friends, and extracurricular. So one of the issues that we are collectively not very good at as, as educators is actually predicting how long homework will take students. Now, I'm going to try to track down the research that I read, um, but it, it wasn't a whole study. It was just a comment in passing. And, and at this point, I, I can't seem to locate it. But I remember reading about this, this idea that teachers aren't very effective at predicting how long homework is going to take students. Um, so I'll, I'll try to track that down, see if I can bring that to next week. Now, having said all of that, without having the research at my fingertips, I watched this unfold with my own eyes. I was conducting a workshop in San Antonio. And during that workshop, it was a little bit unique because it included parents and students alongside teachers and administration. And we were talking about grading and assessment and, and some of the sort of typical content that I do present on. And we had just finished a group activity. So everyone was positioned kind of around the room. No one was seated. We were all standing and they were all, all scattered around the room. And I made the comment about the fact that teachers, I, I think I just freshly read that a couple of years ago. And I, I, I made the comment about the fact that teachers aren't very good at estimating how long homework will take. And the students could not have spontaneously nodded their heads more vigorously. 
their eyes popped out of their heads. And so I asked them and they said, that is consistently their experience. So these students uh, in a uh, San Antonio area school district were telling me that what I was asserting to them from what I had read was absolutely their lived experience. And they talked about the the impact that has on hope, right? Why is this taking me so long? It, my teacher said this wasn't going to take me very long. Why is it taking me so long? Uh, the impact on efficacy, right? So kids starting to doubt themselves and, and their belief starts to waver. Maybe I'm not as capable as I thought I was, right? Another a residual effect was trust. Like to them, it it felt dishonest for their teachers to consistently say, this will take you 10 minutes and for it to take 30. This will take you five minutes and that took 20. This will take you 40 minutes and it took an hour and a half. So they felt a little duped in that because teachers seemed to be underestimating. And again, they also talked about the time, the impact on time, right? If that happens in three or four classes, you turn an hour's worth of homework into three hours worth of homework. So the reason I'm so dismissive of the always or never crowds around homework is because the position almost always requires an asterisk, right? So to the homework is evil crowd, are you saying young children, as I said earlier, shouldn't be doing home reading or engage in any learning at home that supports what they did at school? Like I said, home reading, relevant numeracy skills, all that. And then the response is always, oh, no, 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 that's not what I meant. Well, then why not just actually say what you meant instead of this, this sort of assertive position, and then we have to kind of figure out what you actually meant and has to be re-explained to us. Now, to the homework always crowd, are you are you saying that anything goes, that that what matters is that they they have homework regardless of the quality or how relevant it is at deepening the learning of that day? And then they'll say, oh, no, 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 that's not what I meant. Well, again, why don't you just actually say what you mean instead of trying to do these you know, hypothetical exaggerations or, or, you know, all of these sort of pithy little comments. So what's become clear to me uh, over the years is that the homework proponents tend to overestimate its positive impact and the homework opponents tend to exaggerate its harm in most cases. Now, again, the question that Kathy Vaderot put, put forth, does the research make sense for our population of students? Are they consistent with what we've come to know from experience about our type and age of students that we work with. So we know that homework can often be a measure of socioeconomic status and the level of home support that's available. So generally speaking, homework can be supportive of learning, but we have to be very purposeful about making sure it actually is supportive of learning and not just a kind of piling on to present the illusion of rigor. Okay, so part two next week is where I'm going to have six questions for you that you can ask yourself to guide some decisions around homework, and then we'll also talk about the grading implications. A couple of announcements as we close out today. A reminder of the Achieve Institute this August 16th through 18th. Uh, it's an institute focused on promising practices and in instruction, assessment, and grading. That's going to be a virtual event uh, featuring myself, Cassandra Erkins, Nicole Dimich, and Katie White. If you're interested in that uh, event, head over to the solutiontree.com website for details. And I've also added a link to that event in the show notes. Uh, also an update on the summer series. I want to thank all of you who've responded so far to the Google survey. For those of you who haven't, I'd really love for you to do that. If you could follow the link in the show notes to the Google survey, where I'm asking you to rank nine topics from one to nine in order of the topics you'd like to hear during the summer series, which are going to be roundtable discussions with a number of different guests, uh, and that will be the entire episode. After you've done that, there is a section where you can add different topics and suggestions and recommendations as well. Some of you are adding names of people that you're recommending to be part of the panel, and I love that, so please keep doing that. Um, remember uh, to follow the podcast Twitter account for updates, uh, at Tom Shimmer Pod. You can follow me on Twitter, at Tom Shimmer. Shimmer Education on Facebook, uh, Tom Shimmer Podcast on Instagram, and don't forget to check out the YouTube channel as well, Tom Shimmer Podcast on YouTube. Also, please email your questions for Assessment Corner or any suggestions or correspondence about the podcast uh, to TomShimmerPod at gmail.com. Next week, my guest will be Lavana Roth. Lavana is the founder and the lead presenter of Ignite Your Shine. Please subscribe, rate, and review the podcast, especially on Apple Podcasts, of course. And if you like what you hear and you like the podcast, please spread the word about the podcast to your friends and colleagues. Have a great week, everyone. Bye.